So thinking I'd retired to the Bahamas of millionaire S at 14, having had a big house in London and a PR company and just worked myself nearly into, you know, expiring. Um, within five years, I discovered that my ex had gone through pretty much all the money. Um, I had a lot of issues with, with the kids. Uh, I had the cancer. Six months before I had the cancer, my dad had had a stroke on my birthday <clears throat> and then he tried to kill himself. And then six months after I discovered I had breast cancer, my mother discovered she had terminal pancreatic cancer. And then I discovered that the money had gone pretty much. So I think we can safely say that everything that held me together as a life, uh, my family, my parents, my health, my home, my marriage, my country, my house, my money in the bank, my future that I thought I was having, it all went, it, everything went. Welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Rosalind Palmer. Rosalind is an award-winning transformational coach and therapist combining advanced rapid transformational therapy, clinical hypnotherapy and NLP-based coaching to create deep desired changes. Formerly the founder of an award-winning London PR agency, head of marketing for an international charity and with 20 plus year career in leading London agencies. She knows how to be 100% driven and successful. She has handled PR for the leading motivational change makers, including Tony Robbins, Edward D. Bruno, Brendan Bays, Robert Holden, and having made a million pounds after selling her company and London house by age of 40 she was a former poster girl for what success looks like now there's so much more to this wonderful lady let's bring her on hi Rosalind how are you doing I'm good I'm delighted to be here and with you and Bobby the palm tree yeah Bobby the palm tree everybody knows there's a palm tree <laughs> right behind me in screen <laughs> he's with me in every interview I love um, it <laughs> yeah, did you have a nice holidays I did. Yes, I've been away. I went to um, Crete. Uh, so that was lovely. Uh, yeah. Lovely. Lovely to see the sun and the sea and just relax. Uh, yes, I'm feeling very good. Thank you. Oh, amazing. Um, so I we met through uh, a friend, Rachel Alno. Right? That's correct. And uh, she, I interviewed her on, on my podcast in the last series and she introduced me to you. And boy, did you did you have an amazing story? <laughs> <laughs> it's still ongoing. <laughs> yeah, it's still, still ongoing. Um, so I know who you are. Our listeners don't know who you are. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Who you are? Brief overview of who Rosalind is. Yes. Yeah, so um, I clearly, I I always joke that when I chose this this life, I clearly joined a queue called very interesting. Um, <laughs> brackets not at all boring um, which is great when it's great and sometimes when it's not so great you think why did I join that queue so I come from pretty humble background my parents were greengrocers. as I, I was born in Nottinghamshire um, they had the proper corner shop um, and it was my father's mother's before them. So it went back several generations. So they were that shop in a terrace street, two up, two down, who really I, I didn't realize at the time, but I'm, I'm talking with great retrospect and understanding about my childhood. They were the social services of their day. So on paper, I would say I was born into a really poor uh, environment. They actually pulled the whole street down for slum clearance when I was about five. And my parents lost not only their house, but their livelihood. And I, I remember there being a lot of stress and friction in the house because obviously everything depended on that. And it was multi-generational. But then they went and built other shops. We moved to a, a posher neighborhood. Um, I went to a nice local school and I lived what would be, I would imagine, a 60s and 70s quite normal 
sort of childhood. I went to the local school. I went to the then the massive comprehensive, which I have to say was quite a, quite a culture shock, having gone to the kind of local little school. Um, and not a particularly privileged life, as I say, you know, I went to a comprehensive, my parents were grocers, um, but I was bright. That was probably my thing. Also, I was very, very ill as a child. I was very ill as a child. I died effectively when I was one and a half. I had misdiagnosed whooping cough and German measles. And by the time my parents got me to the hospital, both my lungs collapsed and they were actually told your baby is dead. Um, and then they revived me with massive doses of antibiotics. Um, I was in an isolation hospital for, I think, about at least 11 weeks. And and I was always that child that people were a bit worried about because if I got ill, it could be really serious. And so I did miss a lot of school, um, but it made me go within because back in my day, uh, I am that age, when you didn't do anything during the day. Uh, there was no TV. There was no, you know, gadgets. Um, you read. You read or you wrote or you painted or you. So I became incredibly imaginative. I was a child who lived a lot of time in her imagination. I read extensively, which probably led to me then going to London and doing a degree in English literature. So um but I realized I was always the outlier because I was quite bullied at school because I was given drugs that made all my dentine come through the wrong color and I missed a lot of school. And so I'd be the one who kind of wasn't in any of the cliques, wasn't in any of the groups, but then would come back and be quite clever. And then they resented you for it. So I always felt like an outlier. Um, my parents were fiercely private and independent both my parents were only children um I came from a very strong matriarchal family as well so lots of strong women who always worked my mum always worked my grandma always worked my other grandma was a mill worker in Yorkshire so I I'm, I'm saying all this now because I realize how incredibly formative <laughs> it all was and then I ended up in London after my English degree in the kind of totally bonkers world of public relations. So that probably gives you quite a lot that you might want to ask a few questions about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like from a young age, you started off with a massive challenge like an illness. And that is, I guess it's a trauma that's been um get stored we all know that our trauma starts from our childhood we'll talk a bit about that you know during um obviously we talk about your therapy but um you talk quite a lot about your challenges you've experienced more challenges later on in your life and how they broke you open can you yeah. tell us more about that well yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Probably going back to my 20s when I ended up in PR, um, it nearly came to a grinding halt because I really wasn't very well because I'm in this crazy world where you're working 100 hour weeks, a lot of drink. I came through the 80s and 90s in, you know, London agency life, a lot of drink, not much sleep, um, life on the hoof. Um, living in the fast lane and my body given all that earlier um, issues and my uh, immune system really having me shot to pieces by being given antibiotics for seven years as a child um, I just wasn't coping very well so the doctor was just prescribing more and more and more things you know oh you're not having any periods have these tablets oh you've got irritable bowel have these tablets oh forever um, you've got psoriasis have this stuff um, you know etc etc but I was very lucky that I actually ended up working at Lynn Franks, which is what Absolutely Fabulous is based on. And it really was that crazy. In fact, it was more crazy than the TV program. Um, but the great thing was they were nearly all Buddhists and Lynn was into macrobiotic food and we were terribly trendy. We did London Fashion Week. We had all celebs and everything as our clients. And so immediately people started speaking in a language I didn't know, which was you need to stop going to the doctor, <laughs> you know, things like that. And um, you need to eat macrobiotic food and you need to see an Ayurvedic doctor and you need to have acupuncture and you need to go on a cleanse and um, have you tried meditation? And it was like, woo, you know, this girl from a Nottingham comprehensive, it was very strange. Um, 
So that, I think, was one of my first great adversities, which was health. And of course, that has dogged me or continued on and off because in fast forward to the 90s when I had my own PR company and I again was in that incredibly stressful world of not only a stressful world of PR or managing a company, but it being your own company as well. And again, it was really taking its toll physically, also emotionally. I think I was sort of hanging on by my fingernails. My Ayurvedic doctor said he didn't know if I was going to have the mental or the physical breakdown first. Um, and so I had lots and lots of sticking plasters. Again, massage, Ayurvedic medicine, acupuncture, um, you name it, retreats, flotation tanks, all the whole nine yards. And I know we're going to talk later about mindset because I, I did the PR for um, probably the world's leading mindset people. So I really understood about mind and epigenetics. But I was hanging on by a thread and I thought I'd got away with it. I sold my PR business and retired to the Bahamas with a palm tree very like Bob, actually. Oh, uh, In fact, a lot of palm trees very like Bob, but a <laughs> not very dissimilar to the one behind you. But then two years later, cancer came and I realized I'd laid the seeds, done the damage, although there was also a spiritual element to having that cancer, which I'm very happy to talk about. Um, so I came through cancer, came through breast cancer, but went with my instinct and had the least invasive, didn't have oncology, went and lived on an out island in the Bahamas for two years, where if we couldn't grow it or people couldn't catch it or I couldn't bake it, we didn't have it, we didn't have any TV. Um, it was proper kind of off grid living. My nearest neighbor was two and a half miles away. So I came through that adversity. Um, I went through the adversity of losing everything, um, which is massive. And a lot of the time I used to just do whole podcasts about it. But I, I, I now just see it as a, a stage. Um, so thinking I'd retired to the Bahamas of millionaire S at 40 and having had a big house in London and a PR company and just worked myself nearly into, you know, expiring. Um, within five years, I discovered that my ex had gone through pretty much all the money. Um, I had a lot of issues with, with the kids. Uh, I had the cancer six months before I had the cancer. My dad had had a stroke on my birthday <clears throat> and then he tried to kill himself and then six months after I discovered I had breast cancer, my mother discovered she had terminal pancreatic cancer. And then I discovered that the money had gone pretty much. So I think we can safely say that everything that held me together as a life, uh, my family, my parents, my health, my home, my marriage, my country, my house, my money in the bank, my future that I thought I was having, it all went. It everything went. So I ended up back in England, a single unemployed mum who had to reinvent herself. So that was massive, obviously. Um, and I needed a lot of therapy and help to get through that. But I did. I remarried, I married my childhood sweetheart, which seemed like a really good idea at the time, but I couldn't quite happily do a whole podcast on why that might not be a really good idea to lots of people. <laughs> When you've spent the best part of 30 years being different people on different paths, after that initial, oh, we found each other again, kind of wears off, you kind of go, who are you? And, you know, and I did then go through probably what I think is the longest dark night of my soul. So because I didn't want to be a failure again with a second marriage, I was living back in the village where my dad was living because my mum was dead and I was looking after him. I became head of marketing and PR um, for the Leprosy Mission, international charity. So I spent a lot of time in India and Africa helping the world's most marginalized people. But I lost myself. I hit the menopause. I didn't know who I was. He wasn't very sympathetic because I wasn't this kind of person of 30 years ago. Suddenly when I'm going through the menopause, and, you know, brain fog and the whole nine yards. And so that was a truly awful time really when I really felt I'd lost myself I went on to antidepressants and sleeping tablets and even though I was working at a very incredibly worthwhile company and doing a lot of really worthwhile work thank god um I did feel like I slept walked through quite a long time and that was a very difficult time it was actually a lot more difficult than the cancer and losing everything time because there was still a 
a kind of resilience within me, a, a rebound. I call myself a weeble. It's this little toy that used to wobble, but it didn't fall down. You know, the weeble was still there. But during that time, it was really difficult. Um, and then I trained as a therapist. Um, and I really thought, well, <laughs> I've had a lot of therapy and I've been very, very screwed up. And I know what it feels like to get close to wanting to kill yourself. I'd had bulimia in the past. You know, I'd done a lot of really good things to navigate my life, but I'd done some not so clever things, you know, definitely drank too much. And, you know, some of the some of the issues that hadn't really been dealt with. Mm. Um, but it made me, if I may say so, a phenomenal therapist because I, I'm phenomenally empathetic, um, deep compassion. You know, I really have walked that path and been very broken. Um and yes, and in recent years, I've, you know, entered into the best relationship of my life. I did a lot more work on myself. Um, I'm a therapist and a coach, as you know. I use that communication skill I clearly had in 20 odd years in PR and marketing to, to really convey a lot about the issues that we're talking about. Um, and I've awakened my soul. Yeah, so that was that has been quite like, obviously, when you experience extreme trauma after trauma in a rapid you know um pace and in a short period of time it often does lead to your spiritual awakening you when you were going through it um well I've, I've got several questions within that actually like first was it like you know we often get into a narcissistic and empath relationship right so exactly. you said you're, you're second empath- marriage that was my second marriage basically yeah, yeah. so it's yeah. it's I mean I think there are there are many people who are probably in the same situation right now you know experiencing it um trauma bonds and uh, everything coming together what would you say to them like if they are really struggling in that type of relationship I, I found I found a poem that I'd written I think when I was really at my lowest ebb and it was quite profound and it really spoke an incredible deep truth and so I know I do know because I've been through several dark nights of the soul and difficult times and the belly of the whale and whatever we want to call it um you're still there you are still there inside there is still you inside and all you need is within it's just that you know a bit like you know you can do this thing I I have this uh you know, diamond and I, I've seen it done with children where you know you put all the terrible things on it and make it all dirty and they kind of go well that's how I feel and I feel terrible and I feel like a loser and I feel like a, a jerk and all the rest of it and then you pull it all off and you kind of polish it again you go that's still there and interestingly I did a therapy session on somebody who was quite lost a couple of weeks ago and in the in the transformational part under hypnosis she went there's a diamond inside of me and I it, it kind of nearly made me cry because I thought that's it there is there's this like this diamond there is this you your soul your spark your inner power whatever it is there is a truth that lies within you and it never ever gets taken away however terrible the circumstances are so when you are in that really terrible place where you are literally looking in the mirror going I don't know who I am I don't even know how I got here who how did this happen how do I move from here go within at that point go within and just know that that truth that power that is within you there's some great exercises it's like what did you love to do when you were five you know what made you happy do more of that think about that think about being that that younger you and and just take one step you know if you're absolutely in the bottom of the slough of death pond you literally feel life isn't worth living anymore and I've been there I literally spent one whole evening with five packets of Zopiclone sleeping tablets and a bottle of whiskey. And trust me, it wouldn't have even taken one packet to, you know, have never woken up again. And I just couldn't do it. Um, I think also because I've always had quite a strong faith, um, there was just a voice going, this isn't the solution. Um, I mean, Richard Bandler, who founded NLP, he always says that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. (laughs) Um, But I know when you're in the middle of those things, they don't feel temporary. They feel all encompassing. So my advice would be if you're absolutely in that place, just remember this too shall pass. 
you have that diamond within you it just needs finding and polishing again and take one step towards what made you happy when you were young and you didn't have all of the responsibilities you have now even if it's just a walk in nature or getting some good night's sleep or just change of scene or something and when you start to do that it all will start to move in the right direction Oh, yeah, hundred percent. I think it is quite relatable as well. Um, when you're in such a dark, dark place, you just don't see the light at the end under the tunnel, right? Yeah. And you know, I I could relate. Like I was one. Obviously, I've been through quite a lot of adversity myself, and many of our listeners might be as are going through or been through it. Um, I've I remember like the the I've sat with bunch of pills is like I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna end this now yeah right but that voice that you talked about that voice that your higher self your universe or whatever your soul is speaking to you it's not the answer you got so much greatness within you just be patient and it I just didn't I didn't act on it I didn't act on it whatsoever and and you're right you are like the this is the thing you we're all we all have this massive treasure and diamond diamonds inside of us but sometimes it's like filtered by all the trauma that we've experienced and we have to clear that trauma out right um we'll talk we'll talk about more about trauma but you know let's talk about your um so you were talking you've been talking you're talking about your PR agency um (laughs) that is like award-winning PR agency that's That's right that's the the, the, (laughs) behind me that's the Oscar of the PR world oh wow amazing not just any little award but you know like 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 amazing (laughs) congratulations um but you worked with Tony Robbins and amongst other influencers influencers how was that experience working with Tony Robbins and like obviously you talked about burning out but what was the experience like working with him? Well, that saw life? me through the 90s, really. I mean, thank God. In fact, it's seen me through my life, to be honest. Um, so very early in my PR company in the 90s, I'm, I'm nine, let's say 93, 94, probably, um, one of my clients actually said to me, oh, there's this really weird American guy who's coming for this weekend conference. And I thought I'd buy you a ticket because, you know, I think you're into all of that kind of stuff, aren't you? And she said, um, would you like to come with me? And I thought, yes, of course. Why not? So off we go. And um, and it was Unleash the Power Within Tony Robbins weekend. Um, you know, and I think to say it was life changing is an understatement. Um, and my my husband at the time went too, and we found ourselves signing up for the whole of kind of Mastery University. Although I, I worked out, I remember standing at the table thinking, I, I think this entire investment is what I'm earning for the whole year. <laughs> you know, it was like that's before the air travel and the, and the hotels. I remember thinking, is this a terribly wise move? You know. So <laughs> so early in our our business career but um and then I thought well here's the deal uh I know how to offset that I'll do his PR because he was getting terrible PR at the time in England he wasn't really known there was a lot of mistrust obviously you know this strange cult this strange man you know ever brainwashing people it's everybody's going to you know go mad kind of thing um so Actually, the course I'd gone on wasn't UPW. It was like a pre-UPW. They don't do it anymore. And they said, oh, we're going to do UPW in, I think it was Birmingham. Uh, it was Birmingham, actually, you know, and I thought, right. And and he said before it, he said, if you go to UPW, you need to state your intention. And so I state my intention to the universe, which is I want to meet Tony and do his PR. So <laughs> <laughs> Off I go to UPW and uh, I have a little note all written out in my pocket, you know, dear Mr. Robbins, I don't know if you're aware, but, you know, you're getting terrible, terrible PR and news headlines and, you know, I am I can help you, la, la, la. Anyway, I ended up walking to the fire walk, turned to the side of me, there's Tony. No. And, <laughs> I you, yeah, I kid you not. And he actually said to me a lot, something along the lines of, so what's your intention? And I said, oh, it's funny you should ask me that. <laughs> 
here's a note and I gave him the note I this is a true story um and thinking oh I'll never hear anything from them and then like about two weeks later I get called from the Robbins organization going oh you know we'd like to talk to you about the PR so I did Tony Robbins PR um I did the whole of Mastery University I went to Hawaii I went to Phoenix Arizona I went to Aspen Colorado you know, they are very life changing, full on kind of courses. But because of it, I was open to a whole new network of people and like minded people and people, you know, my parents thought I'd gone mad. They thought I had joined a cult. And <laughs> That's what everybody thinks. That I, needed, I needed, you know, saving that there, there needed to be a family intervention and, you know, and I should be taken to church and something should happen and make me normal again. Um, until I got my mum to do UPW and she used to walk around her clothes with all the bungalows with her firewall t shirt <laughs> 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 telling all the neighbours in a little village in Nottingham that, you know, she at 71 had done a firewalk. So, um, yes, I met Brandon Bays um, through Tony Robbins and Brandon Bays was doing the journey, which was probably the original mind body healing modality epigenetics and she was only like seeing 30 people in a church hall when we started with her and when we finished she was Brandon Bays and the person she is today um I worked with Robert Holden who did the happiness clinic in Bristol and I worked with Edward de Bono the creation of lateral thinking um who did six thinking hats so I then trained in NLP with Richard Bandler because Tony always referred to him as the Antichrist (laughs) and I thought well it'd be interesting to see what that looks like and during that training I trained in hypnotherapy with Paul McKenna Um, and so I was actually certified in these modalities but of course I never actually practiced them per se apart from really within my business of making it a good business to work for and and really empowering my staff and the reason we won that award apart from the fact that we were really successful and all the finances added up and the spreadsheets all looked nice and the margins worked well what was actually cited at the award ceremony was that we probably had the best attitude towards staff of any agency in London at that time wow. so I'm really That's proud amazing. of that That's yeah amazing. really really and I'm still best friends with two people who worked for me Oh, um, that's really back nice. in the day so yeah so yeah that was quite some journey but of course it just set me up with those principles that grounding in NLP doing the whole of Tony's work the journey so understanding about the mind body connection and very spiritual Brandon is very very spiritual mm. um in fact funny story we sort of fell out because I always said you can't PR a course you don't you haven't been on um, and she had a course called the No Ego Retreat. <laughs> and I said, oh, so when am I going on the No Ego Retreat? And she said, you're not. I don't want you in the room. I don't, oh. want, you, <laughs> you know, I don't want your energy in the room. And oh I was like, God. and of course, you know, I get the irony now. I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't want my energy? <laughs> I have to know I'm a leading PR person. You know, I can make you famous. And she went, exactly. That's why I don't want that energy in the room. Um, and I was really upset at the at the time. But now I do see it, you know, with great humor. And also her parting words to me were, Roz, it's going to take you a really long time to know. But the less you try, the more successful you'll be. Oh, that is so true. That is so true. It's like I was um, I was interviewing somebody the other, the other day and we were talking about the desperate energy that you put out into the world. So we're like, go, 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 do you, yeah. I have to do this. I have to do it's some, it's form of control. It's form of ego. You want to yeah. do everything. Yeah. But I had somebody who's like, why are you literally asked me the same question? It's like, I'm doing exactly the same thing as you. How come you're winning all these awards? How come you're uh, you're excelling? How come you're getting all these opportunities that I'm working toward? It's like it's because you're holding on to it desperately. You've let go. Yeah, absolutely. Like, less is more. Less is more. And it's like I say, I'm quite laid back at whatever mission I've got. And I'm just quite chill. And it just comes like, oh, okay, six months later. Well, I had to yeah. learn the hard way. I definitely had to learn the hard way. So when 
when the implosion that I call it happened, you know, when everything happened in that 18 month period and, and it started with my dad having a stroke on my birthday. The kids were very, I adopted my children. I, I don't talk about it for privacy reasons, but you know, there were some really serious issues. I mean, not fun, really serious issues. I'm in a foreign country where I don't have any status or citizenship. I'm totally displaced from everything I'd known, my ego, my my work, my home. Um, and then kind of boom, 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 all the things happen. Dad had his stroke. I discover I have cancer. Dad tries to kill himself. You know, our dog gets, oh, the dog gets run over. Um, then mum discovers she has cancer. Then dad tries to kill himself again. And then I discover the money's gone and, you know, nothing, nothing, none of that fabric held together. I think discovering mum had pancreatic cancer was quite near the end mm. and I remember I was on the beach looking quite like the beach behind you where we lived and I used to take the dogs out in the morning at sunrise and at sunset and I was there at sunset and I was walking up and down the beach and I literally was screaming f off god just you can just yeah oh I mean I'm serious I mean I like to call it my f off god phase and I literally walked up and down that beach screaming, you can just, you know, I've, I've had it. And then I literally went, I'm going to count to five. And if you don't give me a sign, I'm done with you. And I counted to five and a comet went across the sky. No, that True. is amazing. True story. And also it made me really cross because I was like, oh, you won't even let me go. You won't even let me go. Like now look what you did. And then that <laughs> night I went to bed all discombobulated, kind of very even more angry with him because he wouldn't let me go. It was like <laughs> talk about pull out the big guns and send a comet <laughs> across the sky. You know, <laughs> how dare you? Um, and then I had this really profound dream. And the dream was that I was hanging on by my fingernails um, with a deep gorge, you know, falling below me. And somebody was stamping on my fingernails trying to, and they just kept shouting, let go, let go. And eventually I let go. Um, And I wouldn't say that the next phase of my life, you know, when I returned to England and filed for divorce and a whole load of other things was fun or easy, but it was necessary. And actually, I had to learn to surrender in the most brutal of ways um, that there was literally nothing left to hang on for anymore. But that sign and that dream and quite a few other synchronicities that happened at that time made me realize it was part of a journey, a different journey. Mm, it's it's a, what I say is like, you will have your awakening when you suffer enough. Yes. <laughs> enough. And it's like, it's crazy because everything happens back to back, back to back. And then you go through hell and then you're like, you're just like, no, no more. And you're, that's when you're screaming at God, universe, life, whatever. Yeah. And that's when it's like, well, we've been waiting for you to scream at me. That's exactly. <laughs> me to give you that message. You finally got there. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I laugh about it now and you laugh about it now, but but, you know, it's not easy at the time, but but it's like, you know, I'm I'm connecting more and more, I'm finding more synchronicities and just finding lots of like-minded people and I think the one thing I find when we all get talking is we've all had some deep adversity, Mm. we've all had some trauma or adversity or you know that we've all come through something absolutely you know it doesn't take long into that new conversation for us to kind of and also we don't we don't we don't live in that place either I think that's really important to say you know we don't dwell on it it's not like our story that we tell all the time and wear like a badge um but it definitely is there yeah it's very transformational it's like it's like it comes out in a motivational way it's like uh, not a victim mentality but it's like problem solving solution way exactly and it's like it's yeah yeah and it's it's interesting every most of the people that I interviewed in my in my podcast as well and knowing our tribe of people spiritual people around me they've all had 
quite a lot of like adverse background and also like you know and then they firefighters basically like I'm talking about IFS now so it's like the yeah. firefighters through the roof with like you know drinking and ignoring and numbing and yeah uh, overworking so they don't feel that pain I was one of them but I didn't drink okay. to a point yeah, yeah I just I was numbing through gaming all the time you know so and I'm too then, old for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I stopped at Space Invaders. <laughs> I think it's like, it's like, okay, well, my soul's not going to do that. I'm going to do this instead. <laughs> it's like almost like a pre-plan when you come into this world. It's like, yeah, it I'm going to do no, this. No, it is. It is. And, you know, and I see it more and more and more. And, um, you know, and it doesn't mean that curveballs don't come curveballs do come but I think the ability like the weeble for me the weeble analogy is really good it's like you know I still kind of go boom every so often but I go dum, 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 and come yeah, right yeah. you know yeah. there's a lot of ballast you know it's yeah. added it's added the ballast it's added the weight you know yeah it's, and it's you, you right yeah and you talk about the obviously we we laugh about it now but this is the beauty of it because you laugh and you're it's light-hearted because you've healed through it you know, yeah. and that's really important because when you're when you still have that trauma, you get triggered left, right, and center. Even talking oh, about yeah. it, left, right, and center, yeah. right? Yeah, my um, my second marriage was as again that whole time because I thought I'd come through so much up to that point, you know. And in fact, people were already going, "Oh, you're amazing! You should write a book." And you know, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. It came out that came out sounding really sarcastic. I don't mean it in that way. But I knew that the story was, there was a part of me that just knew that that story wasn't over. I, yeah. I knew, I knew, I just knew. And it, and it didn't feel right to talk about, oh, I came through all of this and here I am. Because where I was wasn't in a particularly great place. Because like you say, the, the kind of empath narcissist um, relationship was going on. And that was really, really difficult navigating that. That was the time that, you know, I... I really had to look out to the other things. Um, and, you know, I have this core philosophy of kind of five Fs. Um, again, learned it at a Tony Robbins or developed from something I learned at a Tony Robbins, which is, you know, you need faith. So faith in God, the universe, yourself, nature, fitness, mind and body, um, family um, and friends and look and I know <laughs> ain't everybody's actual family <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I'm a therapist so yeah. the stories I hear I, I'm not going to go oh I think what you need to do is really make up with your dad no that is not going to happen but it's your tribe okay it's your tribe um, it's your connection connectivity finance which is your career you know what you do what also how you pay it forward and then I forgot for a very, very, very long time to add that one. And that one's fun. Uh, yeah. Oh, my God. Enjoy that the journey. Is... And I for... I didn't even yeah. know. I didn't even know fun was available. You yeah. know, there were whole times of my life where it was like, I just have to battle on. This is really, really character building. And I'm I'm a warrior. No, have some fun. <laughs> yes a hundred percent totally agree even when you're doing that inner work you're like inner work inner work inner work inner yeah. work but, yeah. but it's like really exactly. realizing actually let's just like stop the inner work for well, we can still yeah. do that, still do that but have fun at the same 100%. time as well oh uh, yeah I totally agree I, I've kind of just come to that conclusion as well recently. So I went on a find your values workshop about six years ago and I was you know and it was great and it was like loads of people and we were all sat in a circle sharing our values at the end of the day <laughs> everybody's going fun and I'm like looking at my I'm looking, I'm looking at my long list you know the long list and I'm thinking I'm like, I'm like where's fun you know what happened what happened to fun and I realized you know fun I didn't think fun was available to me or I thought fun was conditional this this kind of when then loop you know when you've done your homework when you've been a good girl when you've tidied your room then you can have an ice cream or then you can watch the television you know when you've ticked xyz abc xyz then you can and this when then loop is awful um because we we end up doing all the whens and never having a then so yeah 
I thought I'm just gonna have some bends. <laughs> Forget <laughs> gonna, the bends. Let's do the bends have some right fun. now. I'm gonna have some fun. So I had a little bit of an inheritance, and I went to all these a fests all over the world, and and I did quite a lot of traveling. And uh, I thought, yeah, I think I'm just gonna have some fun. Actually, <laughs> oh, this is this is amazing because we're talking about this because I actually went to Tony Robbins um, event this year. Um, well, we were supposed to go during 2020, but got obviously cancelled because of pandemic um and he just he he came to Birmingham in July and we did the, yeah. uh, we, the oh, and I nearly the went the... I nearly staffed it because really? I sometimes, yeah I sometimes staff some of the events but I just couldn't do the the timing so yeah, yeah. It, it was just so life-changing like the way it was I've never experienced anything like it before. Like, you know, it was just incredible. And then I actually started traveling after that event. It was like, I want to have fun. I want to go and do things by myself. And I did that, you know, it's like, okay, I've come out of a, I kind of came and came out of a toxic relationship. It's like, I need to find myself, go into Tony Robbins and he was like, whoa, make a move, make a move. And you're yeah, like making yeah. a move all the way through the travel. I love it. <laughs> Even if you feel anxious. Like... <laughs> and, you're, and you're such a great companion when you love yourself. So yeah. I did loads of solo travel and I used to love going to the cinema on my own. And yeah. there's a whole mind shift shift from thinking, oh, sad, twice divorcee to isn't this great? You know, I can see whatever film I want to see. I can do, you know, I love being in a relationship now. I truly do. I realize as a as a soul, as a human being, I I like the connection. I do like that. But it has to be the right one. And it has to be on terms that work for both of you. And that mm-hmm. took a lot of work. I had to do the work. I really did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, it usually yeah. is like secure person will not you. You, you have to be secure first in order 100%. to crack that secure. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, a lot of people say we go into it, attachment styles a little bit, you know, so a lot of people talk about the anxious and avoidant, but you got to do the work, right? Or the anxious needs to be with the with the secure. It's like, no, you got a lot of stuff you need to deal with. No, and I, well, I did loads of work. I, I went to AFEST um, and it was on love and relationships. So of course, yeah. I was able to chalk it all up to CPD, you know, continuing personal development because I went, you know, all to learn all about it as a therapist. No, I went to learn all about it as a broken twice divorced woman (laughs) (laughs) and it it was just really great and there were a couple of absolutely life-changing seminars then um I think Esther Perel is one definitely but there's a really great guy called Dan Savage who's a kind of a gay agony aunt and Dan Savage was a game changer for me because he talks about the price of admission and Dan Savage talks about how for any relationship and I think this goes for almost anything you want in life it could also go for your career maybe or whatever um but he, he talks strictly in the context of relationships he'll go what's the price of admission so for example you know you have a perfect nobody has a perfect but I'm using I'm using a term okay you have a near perfect relationship you know where they're like oh you're on a mind with them and you're spiritually aligned with them and you you're attracted to them and the energy is fantastic and your values are shared and you all but they chew with their mouth open and you know and have (laughs) And have no table <laughs> every, and every time you sit there you're like could you just chew with your mouth closed for god's sake you know and he actually uses this as an example and he goes well maybe they could or maybe you could stop asking them to and you could actually go that's the price of admission mm-hmm. i pay the price of admission for that nearly wonderful relationship and i just learn to ignore it I learned to just love them and ignore that bit and look away and not worry about it and just see all the other things in them that's the price of admission and that was a game changer for me oh amazing like I love these like seminars that you go into and yeah. you, you insights that comes oh my god I'm that as well I need to work on that <laughs> it's, it's amazing um so let's talk about we've talked about your PR um let's talk about your you're a award-winning transformational coach um and a therapist so that's massive difference from PR to therapist what was 
like can you tell us yeah. about that yeah. well well you say that <laughs> <laughs> you say that yeah. um it isn't really um I mean I ended up doing the RTT rapid transformational um training uh although it was actually called the Marissa Peer method when I did it because I was on the inaugural pioneer group so Marissa herself asked me to train she handpicked the first 40 people in the world to train on the very 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 first course because obviously there was no um providence for it there was (laughs) we didn't even have a folder we had kind of a ring binder there were no trainers there was no you know we were the we were the guinea pigs if you like we were the pioneers we were the first course now I'd been to Marissa Peer for hypnotherapy in the 90s and I met her at a Tony Robbins course in Maui Hawaii so it's all these connections and we were friends I even bought art from her daughter her daughter is a phenomenally um talented artist Phaedra um and so Marissa I was at this real turning point of oh my god what next second divorce really not feeling it in my career although it was very you know worthwhile because I was working for the charity but just felt very stagnant in my whole life and I needed a new direction email lands in my inbox going I'm putting this thing together I would like you to be on it and I thought why not why not? I, you know, my my argument was I've had a lot of therapy. <laughs> I've been through a lot of things. I have faced a lot of things. Give it a go. Well, I took to it like a duck to water and I ended up being a trainer for the next 10 courses and clients almost immediately. Um, and I realized that in PR, you have to be very good with people. You have to really read people in PR and marketing. Marketing and PR is really about if you want to be pejorative and horrible it's about manipulation and you know kind of manipulating people like advertising but it's also about understanding you know what people want and giving them what they need um you have to be a great communicator you have to you know be able to assimilate a lot of information and actually simplify it and do it really quickly all of those are really fantastic skills for an RTT therapist, just so you know. So there are many, many transferable skills. I'm also super organized because of having a background in agency life. Um, and so I immediately found I was running a good little business, if you like. You know, I wasn't just being a therapist. I actually know about client servicing. I come from 25 years of client servicing industry background. And so I always had very good very above average um client service and so it made for a very good little business and all of those skills plus I did a lot of soul awakening course and I thought I'm going to really trigger my intuition I'm going to really listen at a deeper level so when I do RTT therapy of course I do RTT and I know the modality brilliantly and it's a brilliant modality but there is something else going on I am listening also I am holding space and listening at that deeper level because of the journey I've been on and then I became a coach because There were lots of people who said, can I stay on this journey with you? And I was like, well, yes, not quite sure how it would look, but let's give it a go. Um, And I realized that by default, I'd become a coach effectively because I was working with people. So I thought, well, so of course, who do I train with? Tony Robbins uh, to become an NLP based coach. And the two fit beautifully together because the, the probably the analogy is, I want, my garden is terrible. I want to plant a new garden. I want a beautiful garden. My life looks like a weedy, horrible wasteland. Um, Coaching is more the let's landscape it. Let's plan it. Let's decide how we're going to look. Where's the gazebo going to go? You know, where's the waterfall and everything. But RTT is we really need to pull the weeds up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So my next question was, what was What is RTT? So it's um, rapid transformational therapy. It's hypnotherapy based, if you like. It's um, if that's the foundation, if we're building a house, that's really clinical hypnotherapy. And clinical hypnotherapy is really about putting somebody into an altered state, i.e. hypnosis. But some people don't go very deep. So they're just in a relaxed place to access often through it will be trauma, but through whatever's happened, the root cause of why a certain 
unwanted behavior or thought or feeling or pattern is still turning up because there will always be a secondary gain. There will always be a reason why that's still turning up. And so that allows you to really go to the source of the issue. And once you understand the source of the issue, you can remove it or change it, renegotiate with the subconscious and go, thanks very much for protecting me in that way. I realize you've been, let's take an example. I realize you've been keeping me overweight because I was abused maybe as a child or I was very unsafe as a child and so you almost protected me like literally protected me and my body has been protecting me because then people won't come near me and I feel cocooned and so that's why I can never get the weight off um so once you find the root you know but RTT is more powerful because it combines CBT cognitive behavioral therapy which is very much about where are we now how do I delineate my life what's going on now some psychotherapy because there are some very tried and tested what's called parts therapy which is the part of you that is damaged what is the inner child work so there's some very tried and tested psychotherapy processes as well and NLP, good old NLP. So we're back with Tony Robbins and, you know, kind of how do I talk to myself? What's the language? What are the visions in my mind? What's going on in my head? It brings all of those together. So it's phenomenally powerful. Mm. So it's, it basically works more on your patterns and behavior. Whereas because I was thinking about the internal family system, um, that is that obviously parts therapy and it goes straight into your trauma does Yes, it's, so you wouldn't go straight into your trauma with RTT in that way. No, you're right. It would be really about how is that pattern of behavior turning up and then finding out through that combo. And the, and the skill of the therapist is that obviously RTT is a combination of all of those elements. And it is an actual modality in itself because you've brought all those elements together. But there are times, you know, you might need to lead more on a dialogue with the hurter or an inner child kind of accessibility. Or other times it might be more pure, what would be clinical hypnotherapy of kind of regression therapy, going back to kind of almost hidden um, times and events and actually creating a syntax or working out why is it that that happened and that happened and that happened and that happened. And so therefore your subconscious is going, we need to keep you safe by doing this all the time or blocking that out. Does, does that explain? Yeah, yeah. Question? I'm just thinking how yeah. I, I think it would be so powerful have the RTT and the IFS together. Like if you if you're doing yeah. the deep work and obviously the deep work, the trauma sometimes leaves your body and leaves. Uh, but then your patterns are still there and you're just walking around with pets. So it's trauma isn't there anymore. So yeah. RTT would fit in perfectly alongside the deep work. Mm, yeah. I mean, I find... I've been doing it for eight years now, I think eight, nine, eight years. Um, it, it, it pretty much, you know, uh, there used to be an advert for Heineken, the beer that reaches the parts that other beers can't or Carlsberger can't reach. And I do find that often people will come having tried many, many other things and the RTT. Um, but again, you know, as well as I do, the client's got to be ready They've got to find the right therapist. The therapist has to really hold that space for them. RTT is phenomenal. I agree with you. There are other modalities that, you know, maybe in conjunction would be even more powerful. But on the whole, it does seem to, to get to the root of, you know, most of the people I work with issues. What's the difference between CBT, EMDR and RTT? EMDR I'm not trained in, so I probably can't. I mean, I've had it, and I, I even went to an um, an introductory um, workshop on it. So that's um, tapping, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's so I, I that's, yeah. That's really about, I think, how that the trauma or the issues are stored, aren't they, at a physical level in the body. And so you're actually kind of releasing them either through, you know, a kind of a movement, um, which I think was probably linked to your meridians, um or we I don't I don't do that okay because I'm not trained in it um but with the CBT because there are elements of CBT and I had CBT when I was really going through the dark night of my soul um I think 
my explanation of CBT, because I'm I'm a great believer in making things simple for people, would be it's a bit like if you were driving in an old fashioned car and your windscreen got shattered and it's in pieces and you know the road's still there, but you're not really seeing it very clearly. Mm. You, you kind of know it's there and you, you keep driving, perhaps if you also can't pull over, you know, but you're kind of seeing it through this kind of shattered reality, if you like, and the bits aren't really creating a really coherent, clear picture. And CBT is about delineating kind of what's going on there, what's going on there, why is that happening? I'm making that picture. So CBT, to my mind, is much more about what's going on on the here and now. Um, clinical hypnotherapy is really going back to the source and the root cause of the problem. And like, and, and your, what you would say is maybe where the trauma is held, although it's not always trauma. Um, you know, often really unwanted behaviours just come through a whole stacking of little things, you know, which you wouldn't probably take as an individual incident and go, oh, that was traumatic. Um, but obviously it's somehow stacked up to that person to create actually probably the same result or the same unwanted behavior as maybe one trauma would do. So it's not necessarily trauma going to the source of the trauma. It's going to the source of the issue, the feeling, what was laid mm. down. Um, and then, as I say, you've got a little bit of psychotherapy with sort of like parts therapy um, and NLP because a lot of it. So I think RTT is probably more towards NLP um, and epigenetics, you know, kind of what's going on when I talk about this in my mind, when I say you stupid, blah, blah, blah. How come I'm ending up, you know, being ill or with an upset tummy because I'm I'm creating that inner turmoil because I'm being I call it the itty bitty shitty committee. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, you know, you've got your itty bitty shitty committee going on in your head going, oh, you loser, there you go again. And, you know, you knew it, you knew at five, you'd never amount to anything. And, you know, why are you doing this? You know, you knew that, you know, when you were 11, it all went horribly wrong. And, you know, what an idiot you are. And don't you look stupid? And who are you to wear that dress? You know, so I'm like, let's just shut that committee up, shall we? <laughs> let's just work <laughs> out where those voices came from. Yeah. And there will be lots of voices. It won't just be a parent or a teacher or a horrible auntie or you know whatever it's going to be like a it's a committee mm. <laughs> and so we work out where the committee's coming from and what they're saying and we we give you a much better committee or I like to call it a sounding board so it's like you create your own board mm. and they're like full of really great things to say so um yeah did that did that yeah. give you yeah a, yeah pretty much like, yeah I'm just thinking yeah. like how long does it take like for you to you know, they say that it takes like quite a long time to form new neural pathways. And yes. so how long would it, because if you've had this pattern and behavior for majority of your life, and you got to unravel it. It takes a lot of time, you know, obviously there's no time scale to it, but how many have like on average, when you're working with your clients, like how long does it take for them to just get to that even halfway point or, or fully there? I usually, I would say three sessions is probably if you want an average, um, but obviously no two people are the same. Mm -hmm. um, I have had times when one session, suddenly all the stars have aligned and they're ready for it. They've maybe done some other deep work or, you know, they're really up for it. And, you know, and I do a lot of preparatory work before the session, loads of paperwork and really so that we hit the ground running in the session. It's not like one of those things where you spend all the session ticking boxes and yeah. <laughs> just going over paperwork and you don't actually do any work. So um, I have dealt with what I thought was going to take a lot and lot of lot of sessions um, and one session and we, you know, all the stars have aligned and we've sort of found found that one hidden bit in the hidden vault that they opened the vault. We found the combo of the vault. We opened it. Clarity was gained. I give a recording afterwards. And so people listen for 21 days or longer. And that's the if you like, if you Google it. How long does it take to change a neural pathway? Most people will say 21 to 28 days. There's a lot of actual scientific research and proof that shows that that repeat listening is going to actually shift that neural pathway to, to the place you want to go. 
But of course, often you need a rinse and repeat or you need a deeper dive because there's still something else hidden in the vault. And that's why it may, might take two or three sessions. I've actually never gone beyond four sessions for the same issue. Mm. Ever. Mm. Um, mm. I've had clients who've had many more than four sessions because, you know, they shift one thing and then they're like, oh, now I've shifted that. You know, something let, else come up. <laughs> well, or now I've shifted that. Let's say weight, for example. I'm feeling confident enough to date. <laughs> you know, mm. so I'd like to work on my confidence, or I'd like to work on my, you know. So often it's a good thing, you know, that because they've got that one out the way, they feel empowered to get another one out of the way. Or you're right, something else might come up. Or you know, I've had clients where I've worked with them for maybe three, four sessions for, let's say, well, anorexia would be a point in case. And then they've said, actually, I've got a drinking habit, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I, I really now want to deal with all of these things that I want to get out of the way. Often, many of the things kind of go anyway, because you're dealing with the kind of core issue. Often the subsidiary unwanted unwelcome things will kind of fall by the wayside anyway but sometimes they do need dealing with in their own own right yeah that, that is, I guess it's perfect for someone who's got anxiety low self-esteem confidence yeah. and all of the yeah it's, it'd be perfect therapy for them because sometimes when you have extreme anxiety or anything else go diving deep probably not a good idea so it's like just like yeah exactly and I like really dealing with the more esoteric issues as well um you know I deal with a lot of high achievers who look like they've got it all going on and they're like I just feel empty is this as good as it gets Mm. I I don't know who I am um I don't even know if I want this anymore you know the whole talking heads how did I get here this is not my beautiful house how did, what and as good as it gets is this as good as it gets I thought I'd feel brilliant by now and I feel empty and will I ever feel purpose will I ever feel passion will I ever feel I love those somewhat more esoteric you know what yeah they're my favorite yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah it's almost like a, a break of a a light bulb moment it's like what is more I've done everything materialistically what is going on why can't I find myself and then you just kind of dive deep it's like oh okay (laughs) yeah amazing so if um someone who is experiencing we talked about burnout quite a lot so if someone's experiencing burnout um what tips would you give to them well I try and avoid it before you get there (laughs) <laughs> that, would be my, that would be my number one what tip. are the signs of a burnout actually what are the signs like you sometimes you don't know your yeah, inner- inability often an inability to switch off starting to lack your own self-care knowing that you should be doing things and you're not not sleeping well um maybe flying off the handle quite quickly you know feeling that you're you're kind of you're losing it you're going to get annoyed very quickly that's all to do with being hurt it's all to do with being exhausted it's all to do with not having everything in perspective um you know you're probably mentally and physically and spiritually and emotionally exhausted um so all of those are warning signs um I did a LinkedIn post a couple of weeks ago actually on exactly what all the warning signs are so just find me on LinkedIn and have a quick look um and there's a bit of a blueprint for all the warning signs but if you're in burnout and of course often you don't know you're there till you literally hit the wall (laughs) um again I I just think it's, well, self-care. Obviously, people talk about self-care, but it's just being kind to yourself. It's all of those five Fs. You know, what can you put your faith back in? Is it just a walk in nature? Is it just, you know, that go hug a tree or you you know walk barefoot across the lawn or you know, is there a faith that you have? I'm not I'm not here to tell you what to believe in, but I there is a lot to believe in beyond yourself. But there's also a lot to believe in in yourself um again the fitness you know what what can I do to to recover both in mind and body obviously meditation is really important being still is really important lots of sleep is really important good nutrition is really important fresh air is really important you know all the things that all good healers and health providers you know health warriors I'm not going to say health providers I don't go near most of the health providers that's also probably a very wise thing um 
yes, again, family, friends, again, if that's not your tribe, find some connectivity. Who can you connect with? Who can you reach out to? Um, obviously, uh, finance, if, if you're absolutely at burnout, you're not going to be working probably. But, you know, what what interests you? What, what, what could you do to not sitting in front of Netflix for five hours a day, clearly? Um, you know, just picking up a book, reading a book, poetry. I love poetry. You know, could it could it just be that, you know, you go back to knitting or macrame? I don't know what works for you. Um, and fun. Yeah. How can you? And of course, when you're absolutely burnt out, fun probably doesn't really seem like it's very near on your agenda. But if fun is literally I'm going to allow myself another three hours in bed and then I'm going to have a hot bath. And really just a walk around the block and, you know, work for an hour volunteering at the animal rescue center, do it. Okay. Yeah. And then the sixth one is forgiveness. Um, forgive yourself, forgive yourself for getting to that place, you know, and forgive yourself for maybe things that you did or said that really weren't your finest hour. I've had many of those not finest hours. And Tony Robbins always says, we do the best we can with the resources we have in the moment we find ourselves. And if that was the best you could do, and even with hindsight, it maybe wasn't very pretty and wasn't great, you can do better and you can forgive yourself for being that person that ended up in that place. Learn from it, grow from it. Mm, beautifully. But that's amazing tips, by the way. Thank you for that. And I'm sure it's going to help so many of our listeners. It's going to help me as well because I feel like I'm okay. burning out right now. <laughs> Oh I guess. Really just, oh, also learn to say no yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So I, I do yeah. have an ebook which is these seven living by these seven rules is a game changer and most of them are saying no and that's free so um I'll give you that link and people yeah, can give it, I will put it in the yeah. Uh, description yeah. um well talking about books let's talk about your book uh reset so you've got a book out can you tell us um about uh -huh. what, what this book is about so uh, Reset is here and um, I'm very proud that it won an award within the first month of being published from Janie Lee Grace Health Awards. And so it's semi-autobiographical. It's kind of half, these are the things that happened to me, which we're talking about now. You know, this is how I ended up in that place. This is what happened when I came through the cancer. This is what happened when I, you know, my life imploded and I was going through the second divorce and this is how I got myself well when I was in my 20s and this is how I got myself well again when I was in my 40s and it's frank you know because I'll say these are some of the things I did that were really good and these are some of the things I did that really with hindsight weren't such a good idea um, and then I give my therapeutic advice, I give my actual advice, or I offer advice from other people I've worked with or learned from. So I'm drawing on a whole bunch of gurus who I've worked with, met, you know, read their books, done their courses. So it's either my advice or an amalgamation of my therapeutic advice. And, you know, you might want to check out, you know, Esther Perel about this, if you're having a total relationship meltdown. Um, so it's like, here's what happened. Here's how I navigated it. And here's how you could navigate it with some really expert advice. Oh, amazing. So that book is on Amazon, right? Yes, yes. And I recorded the audio version. Audio version. Amazing. So there's me, there's me talking it all the way through if you prefer an audio book uh, or there's an ebook or an actual book. So it's on Amazon, yeah. Oh, fab. Um, so you're also a well-being expert for radio show Guild Around Town? Yes, I'm not doing it now because the show's not on anymore, but I um, am still, because I used to live in Newark and that's where that program was, but I do have a monthly well-being newspaper column for um, the Newark Advertiser. So oh, yes, amazing. I, oh, amazing. I, give, I give a distilled piece of accessible advice once a month um, for dealing with all the kind of issues we're up against. The one I've just done is actually actually not understanding what kind of how stress turns up looking at different types of stress and dealing with them and that's oh. coming out this week yeah amazing amazing um so what's your vision what's next for you I mean like you've seen so much like so much stuff already so what's your vision so, well, it is very much that advice from Brandon, you know, the less you try, the more successful you'll be. And 
I did a word for the year a couple of years ago, and it was, well, one was grace, interestingly, and then one was connection. Um, and I think there's always a lag because, you know, the universe doesn't always <laughs> turn up just when you want it to. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm just connecting with so many interesting people. You know, I went to an art exhibition last week and the woman like really connected and her paintings really resonated. And I went on a foraging course and I connected with the woman whose house we were at the course with because she had a hummingbird on her house and that's my logo and I have a tattoo and then she got a card from somebody two days later and so there's a lot of I you know it's happening the more open I am the more synchronicities happen so my vision is to do more of that I live in the countryside I have a three acre small holding I just rescued a cockerel yesterday (laughs) (laughs) so I've got all this all this mishmash of pets I've got sheep and chickens and turkeys and dogs and cats and most of them are rescued and they're pets um so more time in nature more time on my soul journey, more time on connection. I'm enjoying a bit of travel at the moment, but my vision is, I know I'm a healer and I know that the work I do really heals people and helps people. So I want to do more of it. Um, I don't mean more as in work more days, but to continue um, to just keep doing that. Um, And that's it really. And just have a life of balance and joy and fulfillment. And, and growth and connection and all of those good things and oftentimes when you get into that state the universe gives you more and more and more yes, and you're like oh, oh, okay I'm yeah. quite chilled about it well thank <laughs> exactly. you <laughs> it's very true it is very true yeah, yeah. um okay I've so let's stepping on as a speaker at a speaker's bureau actually sorry you know, an actual professional speakers bureau, they've just taken me on. So I will oh, be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There I still go. haven't done that TED talk. So that's probably something. Oh, yeah. Talk. It's something I'm aiming towards <laughs> yeah. as well. Come on. Right. <laughs> there you go. Do it. We're do it. Come yeah, on. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's get into rapid fire questions. Um, okay. I normally ask all of my guests. So I kind of just grill them towards the end. <laughs> okay. Go for it. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What is your definition of the universe life God? Um, so I I believe in God, but not the necessarily, you know, I've I've had a Christian faith in the past and I, I definitely believe in God. Um, the God is more of source, I suppose. Um, I believe in the benevolence and the positivity of God. I absolutely believe uh, there's a lot more to the universe and life and life and death and beyond our mortal understanding of everything than than we do understand. And the more I'm open to source, God, connection, um, the more I know this to be true. And I've had so many incredible clairvoyant and synchronistic experiences in my life I could never dismiss them so my definition is there is more than we are aware of I believe in the good in it I believe that the more we connect to that and connect to each other the greater the world and beyond will be beautiful what do you think happens when you die Well, I believe we're a soul in a human body, and that's taken me a long time to come to that understanding. So it really depends on what you've learned or not learned in this lesson, in this life, and and where you are in your soul's evolution. So if you wanted to put that into a very Christian or orthodox religion, yes, I believe there is heaven or something beyond it, but I believe it's more of a learning ground um and you know your soul will reincarnate if you feel you have other lessons to learn Mm, beautiful how do you define religion and spirituality (laughs) well (laughs) yeah uh not necessarily as the same thing um so I have seen the good that a lot of religions have done. I was head of marketing for a Christian charity and they really helped the most marginalized people in the world I think faith for a lot of people and a belief in an orthodoxy can actually make their lives much better. Prayer, I think, is the most phenomenally healing thing there is. I think connecting to God or source is phenomenal. 
So that's the good side of all of that. Um, but I believe you don't have to have an orthodoxy to be spiritual. I believe that it's way beyond one set of rules and behaviors. I believe God is or source is omnipotent. So why would he be annoyed that you happen to be born in one country and start worshipping something as opposed to something else. I think that would be absolutely ridiculous to think that they'd be that petty. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's all all, all omnip omnipotent and all powerful. And I believe that often what man does, and I say man, but mankind, women, everybody, in the name of religion and the way that we build religions up and we have to have big buildings and all the rest of it, I'm starting to be less and less pleased with as I get older. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Yeah, to let go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To stop trying that to was... come... That was stop clear to as control me. everything <laughs> stop trying to control everything to let go. oh yeah it's it's, it's a battle because <laughs> the ego is right there it's yeah. like no i'm not yeah. gonna, yeah. I'm yeah. Not gonna yeah. let go without yeah. a fight yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes um do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures um, I don't think it has to be a horrible beginning. Um, I don't think there's a blueprint for it. But as I do say, I do definitely connect and resonate and vibrate with people who have been ad through adversity at some point. Um, I definitely do believe um, that right of transition or passage uh, does seem to bring people out the other side. But I don't think it has to be at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm fully in present moment. When? Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here and now. <laughs> yeah. Um, was that a trick question? <laughs> no, no, it was an easy question, but it's like you can make it into a tricky question. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <your> perceptions. <laughs> yeah. um, do you believe that there is an end to healing? So I've learned a lot about healing in the last few years, particularly with what's been going on in the world um, and have having come through cancer and not taken all the orthodox and recommended treatment and trusted myself and, tr and found many, many other uh, ways and modalities. I believe that healing or illness, disease is is purging is the body healing itself okay so the question is is there an end to healing well no in so much as there'll always be a new thing to heal if you've been environmentally influenced because through no fault of your own you've something was sprayed on crops and you breathe it in and your body is really having a bit of a crisis and doesn't like it and so it starts bringing it all out you're going to heal um but i believe that there is a healing path and modality for everything that could come your way. Mm, yeah. yeah. I think that's a better way of answering it. Does that make sense? Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Um, the world needs more of what? <laughs> right. Well, I'm both left and right brain. So I'm going to give you two answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very yin yang, male, female, left, right. I'm like down the middle. So I would say the world need more, needs more truth, but that's a very big conversation about, well, what is truth? But it needs more people not afraid to open their eyes to, to truth and to seek truth, to walk in truth, to speak truth, to live in truth. Um, so that will probably be my left brain answering. And the world needs more, um, more joy, I think, actually. Joy. Fun. 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah yeah that's my right brain <laughs> <laughs> um if there is someone who's going through adversity and can't see the light at the end of, end of the tunnel spiritual awakening dark night of the soul what would you say to them what is that one message that you would say, give them well I think I said that earlier didn't I and I know this sounds trite but it is true but this too shall pass mm-hmm mm-hmm how can people contact you? Um, Rosalynpalmer.com is my website. Rosalyn at 
rosalindpalmer.com is my email. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn, Rosalind Palmer. Um, I'm also on Instagram, although I'm not so active there, but uh, that's Rosalind Palmer Transformation. But if you Google Rosalind Palmer, I pretty much come up. So Amazing, amazing. Oh, thank you so much for coming thank on you. and sharing Brilliant. your wisdom. Really and lovely interview. Great conversation okay. about exactly. everything we discussed and, you know, um, you're, you're truly inspirational after what you've been through and where you're at now. It's just, it's incredible. Eugene is incredible. Thank and I you. hope that our listeners take a lot of hope from Yes, this. I hope that's the one thing that they will go away with. And um, yeah, it's good. It's all good. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. All right. Thank you for listening to this episode. I would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. You can share your thoughts on my facebook or instagram madia sosen if you would like to watch this episode then head over to my youtube channel madia sosen if you enjoyed this episode then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot thank you so much once again and i will see you in the next episode